Warning. Censorship. Warning. Censorship. In the moment that I was leaving, I turned around. Uh, I was at the exit entrance to the whole pod. I turned around and I lifted up my hand to wave. And, uh, and the doors of the, the, the pod began to shake as the men in their, in their cells just banged on their doors as a sign of um, support, uh, love, affection. And uh, I was with the chaplain actually when that happened. And he's emailed me since then and just shared with me that he'll never forget that moment. And it was precious to me as well. And so um, that just gives you a little bit of a picture of the way that they uh, thought toward me and, and treated me. I've been reporting from Grace Life Church since February 14th. Now that was the date of the last sermon given by Pastor James Coates to his congregation west of Edmonton, Alberta, before he turned himself in to provincial authorities for violating a coronavirus public health order. Now he turned himself in the following Tuesday, February 16th. And Pastor Coates, well, he was just recently released, actually last Monday, after serving 35 days in a maximum security provincial facility for violating a public health order that would force him to limit his congregation to just 15% of fire code capacity, but also force his congregation into masks and force them to social distance from each other, something he and his congregation both say absolutely violates their freedom to practice their religion. On February 14th, I spoke with Pastor Coates in his office about what he possibly faced the following Tuesday. You see, Pastor Coates had been previously fined and also arrested and released the prior week for violating the public health orders. Pastor Coates knew on the 14th that he could indeed face jail time. And yet he sat down with me as his last interview to explain his motivations and why he felt that his act of obedience to God rather than obedience to the government was the only recourse that he had as a faithful Christian. Now, this past Sunday was Pastor Coates' first Sunday back at his church since his release from provincial custody. And I've never seen anything like it. Now, his congregation did carry on without him under the shepherding of Associate Pastor Jake Spenced. But Pastor Coates was greatly missed by his congregation that cares so deeply about Pastor Coates and his family. And they so appreciate the sacrifice he and his family, his wife Erin and his two boys made for religious freedom. Though police and Alberta Health Services did try to enter the church on Sunday, elders did not let them in to disrupt the service, something that if the police had done it, would have actually violated the Criminal Code of Canada, Section 176.2. Now, after service, Pastor Coates sat with me again in the very same office for his first interview post-incarceration for the crime of giving a religious service to a completely willing congregation without limits. Take a listen. Pastor James, f first, how are you doing? Emotionally, spiritually, how are you doing? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. I am trying to figure out how I'm doing. I don't know that I've quite um, gotten my feet on the ground as yet. I think I'm still adjusting to just everything that's happened since uh, my imprisonment and uh, don't really have a clear handle on uh, just what kind of world I'm stepping into at this point in time. Um, I'm obviously out of the rhythm of my routine, and uh, a big part of that routine is preaching, and so I look forward to that. It's been a blessing to be here and to reconnect with our people and, and, and express my love for them and to have them express their love for me. But uh, I'm, I'm adjusting, and I can't quite put my finger on what the adjustment is or why I'm feeling it's an adjustment, but it's an adjustment. And uh, I'm thankful to be out and I'm thankful to be here. And uh, I'm looking forward to just putting one foot in front of the next and taking it one day at a time. Now, I don't want you to rehash or relive anything, but what was a day like for you behind bars? Did you have a cellmate? How often were you able to talk to Aaron? What without, you know, the gruesome, gory details, what was a day like? In quarantine, it was a challenge because 
Um, I would get out twice for 15 minutes a day. I can remember one day, I think I told my wife that I had been in my cell for 23 hours between uh, exercises. And, and when you get out, you got 15 minutes and, and that's not a long time. Um, so that was a little bit of a challenge, but, uh, but I was able to get through it and, and get into a bit of a groove. And initially you're just trying to learn the culture that you're in and there's a way that things happen and you're just trying to learn it. So you're up to speed and, and, and that takes some time. And so I could kind of be distracted a little bit just by that entire process. Once I got out of quarantine, I did have a cellmate and, um, you know, he was, uh, a, a, a good cellmate. We got along well and, and, um, had lots of good discussions and conversations and he's called me since I've been out already twice now. And, uh, so, you know, the morning begins around seven o'clock with breakfast. You go down to get breakfast, uh, you have your breakfast and then you return your trays and then you're, you're in your cell for a couple of hours, usually at least until nine, you might get out for an hour, typically got out for an hour ahead of lunchtime and lunch was 11. And then uh, you would get out once for an hour between lunch and supper. And, uh, and then you would get out for another hour, typically between supper and, and bedtime. And, and for that hour, you would, you would, I would spend a lot of time on the phone for sure. Um, I would call my wife a lot. That was obviously a highlight for me uh, in the day. I loved those conversations. I'd have chaplains visit me from time to time. I, I um, could play a little bit of basketball on the court outside, which is basically just a, a cement cube with no roof and, um, and just interact with the guys. Uh, it was, um, they were pretty good to me. They treated me well. Um, I have a, a neat story about the final moment leaving that I can share with you if you'd like to know, but uh, that gives you a little bit of a taste of a normal day. What was the worst part or the hardest thing to adjust to inside? That's a great question. I think adjusting to the diet was a bit challenging. Um, it's, not, it's not a comfortable place to be, obviously. Like I slept pretty, pretty well. But in terms of where you spend your time in your cell during the hours you're awake and not lying down, uh, it's not really a comfortable place to just sit. And, uh, and so it's difficult to be there and, and, and try and be productive, not feel like you can be productive, not be productive. Um, and so that's a bit of a difficulty for sure. One of the, the blessings was receiving lots of mail and mail would come and I could read that and that would feel productive and uh, it would encourage me and strengthen me. But I think just the lack of productivity and, 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 and the diet being what it was and trying to make up, it took me a little while to figure out how to use the canteen effectively uh, for me to be able to get the calories I need without without eating food that's uh, not doing me well. So the diet, the, the time in the cell being uncomfortable from a, a seated perspective. And, um, and there were moments when the tension in the prison, you could feel it, something would be going on and you'd feel just a bit of a tension among the, um, the, the inmates. And that didn't last a long time or wasn't sort of consistent, but some of those moments were a little bit awkward. You, you'd feel the tension in the room and, and, um, I tried not to share that with my wife so as not to make her worry, but, uh, but for the most part, and actually in large part, almost entirely, actually the, the inmates were great to me and uh, I really appreciate them. Did you get a chance to minister to anyone on the inside? Because I think your incarceration was part of your ministry on the outside. Your church just blossomed, uh, even though you weren't here, um, or at least that was my viewpoint spending every Sunday here <laughs> while you were gone. Um, but did you get a chance to minister to somebody on the inside? Yeah, I mean, so once I got into GP, which is general public, I would have guys often come to my door and want to speak with me and would share difficulties in their life with me. And I would share the gospel with them. I mean, we'd be talking through a door to each other, um, but I would share the gospel with them. So that happened often where guys would just come to me. There was a gentleman next door to me and he wanted me to do a Bible study. So I went down to the floor 
I was on tier three. And so we went to the floor where there's tables and sat down he and I within about 60 seconds, three or four of the guys sat down with us. And, and, and there we are in the gospel of John having a Bible study. And, um, yeah, I had lots of opportunities to share the gospel. I didn't get a lot of opportunities with the guards because you're, you're at a bit of a distance away from the guards, but, but in terms of being able to speak to the guys in, in the, the remand, uh, lots of opportunities. And just to kind of show um, the affection that we had for each other, in the moment that I was leaving, I turned around. Uh, I was at the exit entrance to the whole pod. I turned around and I lifted up my hand to wave and, uh, and the doors of the, the, the pod began to shake as the men in their, in their cells just banged on their doors as a sign of, um, support, uh, love, affection. And uh, I was with the chaplain actually when that happened and he's emailed me since then and just shared with me that he'll never forget that moment. And it was precious to me as well. And so, um, that just gives you a little bit of a picture of the way that they uh, thought toward me and, and treated me. Were you aware of just how big your story was while you were inside? I mean, Aaron was on Tucker Carlson. Were you aware of just the international interest in your story? I was, but, but trying to get your mind around that on the inside is difficult. So I, I certainly was aware but even to this point now, I don't think I totally appreciate it. I don't think I'm, I'm, I'm grasping the significance and just how, how big this has gotten. And, uh, and so that's part of the adjustment, I think, is trying to figure out what am I stepping back into here? What, what's, this, what's life going to look like now that this has happened? Will life ever be the same? Um, and so I'm just kind of taking it one day at a time on that. Now, the police were here today. They wanted yeah. to come into the church. Uh, my question, I guess, is, given that you've already been to jail for seven weeks and the police were here today, would you do all of this all over again? Well, the answer is absolutely. Um, I couldn't do any different than I did. I was put in a position that demanded a certain response for me to be obedient to Christ. And um, yeah, absolutely. I would do the exact same thing again in a heartbeat. I, I couldn't do any differently than I did. I've, I've honored my word and my integrity and my conscience, and more importantly, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the entire time. Now, I've heard some of the critics of Grace Life and probably yourself too say that this is, you know, sort of a stunt for fame or glory or money, how would you address that criticism? So I understand that. I think, I think in our world, we are so used to people doing things for vain glory. We, we are not used to seeing men, women of conviction that will take a principled stand based on real conviction tethered to reality as it is because Jesus Christ is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And, uh, and so I, I get it. They don't know me. And so looking from afar, I can totally get it. I can totally understand it being suspicious, just being, just thinking something, uh, that this is suspect on my end. I get that. But, and I don't even know if I really care, to be honest with you. Um, this is not about what other people think. This is about the Lord Jesus Christ. And so I am here to please him, honor him, glorify him. Where the chips fall thereafter is out of my hands. And, uh, and so I get it. I, I understand it. But they just don't know me and um, don't know my heart and, and just can't understand what I'm doing because they've never seen anything like this before. Now... I know every week that I've been here, your congregation prays for the people who have participated in your incarceration. They pray for the RCMP officers. They pray for Alberta Health Services. Do you have a message for the people who are involved in your incarceration? You know, I, I'm wrestling with what that message is at this point in time. Um, to have the RCMP here today 
and wanting to come into the facility was uh, was difficult for me. Um, it is disruptive. It affects my ability to carry out my responsibility to the Lord. You know, in some ways, being in jail wasn't much of a difference because I haven't been free for months. With AHS and the RCMP breathing down my neck for, for months, going into jail was actually reprieve from that. And so um, I'm thankful to be out of jail, but to be here today and to see them still wanting to enforce when this is in the court system, there's clearly a dispute. The dispute needs to play out. Let's let the dispute play out. Um, so I don't know what my message is. Obviously, I would want them to come to know Christ. I would want them to turn from their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I, I have a heart that is full of forgiveness to anyone who's wronged me. And so I, I harbor no unforgiveness toward anyone. And so I guess that would be it at the end of the day is I would just love for them to be reconciled to God through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, Pastor, you've been very generous with your time, and I know this is your first interview since you got out of jail. I want to ask you what your message would be to other pastors like yourself. Their churches aren't open or they're complying with the Alberta Health Services Code, and for that they're turning away members of their congregation. Do you have a message for them? Well, that's difficult too because um, just because a building has the title church on it doesn't mean it's a true church. And to the extent that churches that aren't churches are closed, um, I can take some joy in that. I don't want false churches to be open. And so it's difficult. I mean, I would need to speak with each individual pastor, understand their context, their situation, what they're going through in particular. It's the men that I'm in fellowship with, the men that I know are preachers of the gospel who are approaching the pandemic differently. I don't know that I have a message for them, but I would love to interact with them and see if I can't help them to see things a little bit differently in terms of what we're going through and where we're at and what, what the, the, the right response ought to be. But I recognize that we're going to see things differently at times, and that's okay. And uh, it's not a matter to, to break fellowship over with those men. I love them. And... Um, and, and support them. So it's difficult. I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all message in this situation. Um, and so hopefully that gives some sense of what my mind and heart would be toward that. Lastly, do you have a message for people around the world who supported you, supported Grace mm -hmm. Life, supported your family during this time? Just immensely grateful. Received so many letters, um, emails, the support that's poured in is just uh, overwhelming. And so I'm just, I'm thankful for the prayers, the well wishes, everything that has come to us in this time. Um, I want to be uh, faithful to the Lord and to the extent that that blesses others. I take an immense joy in that. I really live for, for two reasons. One, to see people saved and two, to see them sanctified. And so to hear that the Lord has been using what's happening in my life to strengthen them and cause their spiritual growth and development is just um, makes everything worth it in terms of the sacrifice it's been to me personally and my wife and our church. And so uh, I just uh, a huge hearty thank you, express my love and gratitude to you and, and, and pray for me that I'll continue to be faithful and, and give you an example worthy of imitation. Thank you, Pastor Coates. Thank you. What happened to Pastor Coates is something that I think many of us never thought that we would see in the free and democratic parts of the world. It's something that we would expect to see in places that don't respect religious freedom, places like China, places like North Korea, parts of the Middle East. It's not anything that I would ever have expected to see in my home province of Alberta, a place with the motto, strong and free. What happened to Pastor Coates is an embarrassment to this province. It's a stain on all of us, and it should trouble us all. And yet still, so many powerful people are cheering for his continued persecution 
and the enduring suffering of his family and his congregation. Shame on all of them. And it's my hope that all of us find just one bit of the strength of moral conviction that I see in this congregation each and every Sunday as every single one of them there continues to risk the potential of a $1,200 fine to worship in the corporate body of Christ. For Rebel News, I'm Sheila Gunn-Reed. If you'd like to sign our petition calling on the provincial government to free Pastor Coates, even though he is free, I'd like to print out that petition and deliver it to him on Easter Sunday to show him just how much we all care, how much we all valued the sacrifice that he and his beautiful family made in the interest of religious freedom, please go to freepastorjames.com and add your name.